Hello, I'm John Perry, and I'm joined by Representative Gary Glenn for Representative Gary Glenn John, Report. Good to see you this week. Representative, it's good to see you too. A lot going on in uh, the Michigan House these days. We should maybe start off by talking about legislation that passed just this week that names a bridge in your district in honor of um, uh, in honor of Foreman Aaron Olam, uh, who was a 2009 graduate of uh, Midland High School and was a Navy corpsman or a medic who was assigned to a Marine unit in Afghanistan. Uh, Aaron in 2011 uh, was in combat uh, with the Taliban, was undercover, but when uh, a member of his platoon was hit, it was his job, his duty to, uh, to provide first aid and, and medical assistance. He left his position of cover and in an attempt to give first aid and to help save the life of a, of a Marine to whom he was assigned uh, under his care, he lost his life. And so, uh, uh, you know, the, the definition of duty in terms of the military is you perform the job you're assigned even at risk of your own life. And that, so Aaron gave the ultimate sacrifice in the performance of his duty to his country. And he is the son of Kevin and Debbie Ullum. And uh, one of the newer bridges in Midland, at Eastman Avenue and US 10 near the Midland Mall, is going to be named the Corman Aaron Ullum uh, Bridge, Memorial Bridge. The legislation was sponsored by Senator Jim Stamas. Uh, it passed the Senate unanimously. It passed the House unanimously. Uh, so certainly was gratified to have had an opportunity to play a role in bringing recognition, honestly, to a young man who should be a role model uh, uh, for young people uh, who at the uh, age of 20, I believe he was, had given his life to his country. And so we're proud of him. We're proud of him in Midland. I know that uh, other residents uh, of the county are going to be proud to, to see this kind of recognition come to Aaron. Uh, and I know we had a discussion on the floor the other day. Uh, we'll take a look at that right now. Well, John, it was certainly my honor today to speak in favor on the House floor of a bill introduced by Senator Jim Stamas that would name one of the newer bridges in Midland after Navy Cor Corpsman Aaron Ullum. Uh, Aaron was a 2009 graduate of Midland High School. In 2011, was on duty with a Marine Corps unit uh, to which he was assigned as a medic. They came into combat with the Taliban, and uh, Aaron was undercover, but when his commanding officer was hit and wounded, he left his cover, did his job, did his duty, provided first aid to his commander, but in the process received a fatal wound and was killed in 2011. So I know that the people of Midland County will join me in recognizing the sacrifice made by the Ullum family. Aaron was uh, the son of Kevin and Debbie Ullum of Midland. And so the bridge on Eastman near the mall is now in the future going to be the Corman Aaron Ullum Bridge. And uh, certainly was my honor and privilege to have a part in bringing that kind of recognition to the ultimate sacrifice paid not just by Aaron, but by his family the services they provided as well to their country. And John, the bill will now go to the governor's office. Uh, we, of course, expect him to sign it. And then I look forward to joining uh, Aaron's family at some point in the future when the sign is actually erected on the bridge uh, and it's officially named in, in honor of their son. Uh, and, and I think the honor is certainly due. Um, you know, here was a young man who did his duty to his country and to the Marines to whom he was assigned even at the cost of his life. So we're proud of that sacrifice, and I think it's recognition that is certainly due, and I appreciate uh, Senator Stamus' leadership on it. It was my privilege to carry the bill in the House. Representative lawmakers have started to consider the state's budget for the 2017 fiscal year. That fiscal year actually starts on the 1st of October. Uh, when you have a budget of almost $55 billion, obviously there are a lot of moving parts. Last year, during the budget cycle, you worked on an issue dealing with your own local schools that you said you were going to keep working on. So as we right. come into the 2017 fiscal year, when we talk about at-risk funding, where does that all stand? Well, we've got some major challenges that are in the budget. Uh, you've got the Detroit Public Schools situation where, uh, under threat of bankruptcy, their current unpaid bills amounts to something like $700 million dollars. But, uh, and the way the state constitution is written, the taxpayers of Michigan are liable and responsible for paying the debt 
of a school district that goes bankrupt. But their, their currently unpaid bills are about $700 million. If nothing is done to pay off those bills, then their total debt obligation, if bankruptcy was filed and all the creditors came looking for payment, is $3.5 billion, so five times more. Uh, this is a very distasteful situation, but the choice appears to be $700 million now, or in two months, $3.5 billion, five times more, out of the pockets of Michigan taxpayers. I think the question uh, in regards to Detroit is uh, unfortunate as it may be, it appears we have little choice but to protect taxpayers by helping the district pay the 700 million in unpaid bills now. The question is, what changes in management will we require so that they don't come back repeatedly looking for another bailout? Uh, and I think you'll see some restrictions on how that uh, school district operates in the future significant. Uh, restrictions, uh, state oversight, and that kind of thing. Uh, but specifically to the, and we also have the, the situation in Flint, Flint sure. that's going to be a, a major requirement of the budget. The governor's asking for about $190 million. The uh, state legislature about three months ago approved $30 million, if I remember correctly. Uh, and then we approved another, uh, or $9 million three months ago, and another $30 million uh, more recently. And the governor's asking for another $190 million on top of that. So that's another uh, new demand on the budget that was not anticipated. We do, because Michigan is uh, one of the hotter economies in the country, number one in the creation of new manufacturing jobs, uh, we have right now an unanticipated half billion dollar surplus in the current budget year, which offers the opportunity for a little relief uh, in terms of how much uh, the taxpayers would have to bear. But specifically to your question, uh, we did succeed last year in getting into the House budget and the House passed legislation that would have for the first time ever given the Midland Public Schools, which makes up a pretty large part of my district, sure. first time ever uh, they would have been allocated some portion of the at-risk money. It, uh, that money has been distributed across the state uh, by school district in the past, but there are about 50 school districts, including Midland, that are called privileged school districts some of the financially more stable districts around the country, and we're blessed to live in a community in, in Midland that is in that position. But what that means is, is that even though 28% of the public school students in the Midland public schools are considered at risk, none of the at risk money actually goes to Midland and never has. So the legislation that we got successfully in the House budget last year, which the Senate did not agree with, and so it did not become part of the budget, was to say that that at-risk money ought to be allocated per pupil, not by school district, so that it would go to, the, to uh, students that are considered at risk by the federal definition, regardless of which school district they happen to attend. Um, uh, so Representative Tim Kelly, who is the chairman of the K-12 subcommittee of the Appropriations Committee, agreed, has already agreed, committed, that he will put it back in this House budget. I instructed my staff today to make a call to Representative Kelly's office to make sure that you know we're, we're on track to do that. And then, uh, of course, I'll be at looking here in my second year uh, as a first-term legislator to, to uh, do everything I can to get the Senate to agree with this time. But we're getting on it earlier in the budget process this year than we did the first time around last uh, January, February, March. So it would be, if this legislation succeeds, if we can get the Senate to agree with it as well, the first time the Midland schools have ever gotten any of the at-risk funding. Uh, I know the governor's budget proposal that he put out just this past week does call for an increase in the foundation grant for every school district, but this would be money on top of the foundation grant, this at-risk money, that all the school districts in Michigan get except for about 50, including Midland. So this one would be specific to the Midland Public Schools, but uh, I, I do believe as a matter of principle that if a child uh, is in a household that is classified as at risk financially, uh, that the money should go to the, to the child, not to the school district. So it wouldn't matter where they went to school, they would get uh, their share of the money. So that will be something that I will be doing my best to shepherd through the budget process. So when we look at the budget process, obviously it is an opportunity to affect change. But I would imagine, too, that if you're looking to control the size and control the scope of government, one way you do that is through 
the budget process. It is, and uh, the other thing that has been a hallmark of uh, Republican control of the legislative process for the last uh, five or six years is the budget actually gets done on time, in fact gets done several months in advance. Uh, I think it's five years running, so this would be the six where it would be our intent to have approved the budget and have it done total by June 1st. The fiscal year doesn't start till October. What that allows is for all the local governments who have to set their budgets based on what kind of uh, uh, revenue sharing or aid they get from the state, school districts, cities, townships, and counties. They have three months, uh, June, July, August, September, to prepare to do their budget, as opposed to the way it used to be done, for example, under the Granholm administration. The budget wouldn't be approved till October or later, and the local districts were left to scramble in response. So uh, I, I think Republicans uh, have acted responsibly, uh, applied good sound management principles, and we're giving our local governments three months uh, advance uh, capability to set their own budgets. And I expect that we will meet that standard again this year. Um, last year's budget, or the, the budget we're currently under right now, the state discretionary money over which the state has total control actually went down by a percent. Uh, the, the overall budget went up about two percent because of the federal pass-through money. And that is a challenge that a lot of us find distasteful and we're attempting to get a handle on some of that federal pass-through money uh, as well as the money over which we have direct control. But it, uh, Michigan has, since the year 2000, we have the second slowest rate of increase in state spending in the nation. So it, it is, uh, at least on a relative basis, pretty conservative, uh, which I think we can be proud of. Uh, but I would support a budget that uh, you know, prioritizes. We've got a lot of new challenges, as I said, um, the, to protect taxpayers. It looks like we're going to have to do something with Detroit Public Schools. There's an obvious need to respond to the uh, situation in Flint. Uh, I went down. Uh, just recently, for example, and, and met with the National Guard troops who were deployed and stood at uh, one of the fire Some stations. Some fellow committee members. Yep. Uh. Military and Veterans Affairs Committee went down and, and uh, we actually talked to people in their cars as they came by to pick up water filters and water. Um, and people have asked me, uh, you know, what was my message to them and it was that we, I came from Midland to indicate that we care about what's going on down here. And people have asked, well, what did they say to you? And it was pretty simple, thank you. Um, people seem sincerely grateful for the fact that, uh, that uh, the state has allocated now some $38 million in emergency appropriations and the governor's asking for $190 million more. I know there are some who are politicizing the issue and it doesn't matter how much you appropriate, they're going to say, oh, that's not enough. But uh, the state is making a significant uh, investment. I think it's also an opportunity for civil service reform because even though the governor has manned up, so to speak, and is the only level of government to accept responsibility. The truth is that somebody in DEQ, some water technician, failed to ensure that the pH balance was, uh, was done correctly. I'm told it would have cost all of $150 a month to have done what would have been necessary to prevent the lead poisoning problem uh, in Flint. But the, tr the, the fact is, even though the governor has said, I'm responsible, the buck stops with me because I'm the head of the bureaucracy, that there was somebody who was in a technician position of responsibility who failed to perform their job as a member of the civil service system. And so it's very difficult to remove somebody who did not perform competently. So I think it's an opportunity for some civil service reform as well. Uh, if somebody does a good job uh, as a state employee, they should be rewarded. If somebody screws up royally, as was the case in Flint, uh, there should be some accountability. I had a discussion with one of my adult children over this very question. Uh, I was uh, explaining to him that what the governor did was a matter of character. The governor himself did not personally have anything to do with whether or not the pH was balanced in the water system in Flint. But because he is an adult and took responsibility as the head of that bureaucracy, that that was a mark of character um, uh, as opposed to the person unnamed, whoever it might be, who was actually responsible for having failed to perform the, the simple uh, function of uh, ensuring the water was treated with the correct chemicals. But uh, when someone is found to have failed as egregiously as was the case this time, then we ought to be able to eliminate them from state employment. And it shouldn't take 
multiple hearings and all of these things that are set up in the Civil Service Commission. So I would be supportive of the ability to pretty quickly and uh, uh, be able to, uh, to discipline or fire somebody depending on the, the level of the offense. And in this case, I think it would warrant firing whoever's responsible for a significant uh, failure to perform in a competent manner that put people's health at risk. So it's not only a matter of of addressing the results, the consequences of the failure of the state bureaucracy, but we are responsible for doing everything necessary to make sure something like this doesn't happen to any other community. Uh, so it is an opportunity, and I know there's a sentiment that's shared uh, among the Republican caucus that, that the civil service reform type of legislation ought to also be looked at. Okay, Representative, we're going to take a break right now, Great. but we'll be back with Representative Gary Glenn reports right after this. And we're back with Representative and Gary Glenn reports. You know, Representative, I know you spend a lot of time working with your constituents, listening with your constituents, and taking some of their ideas and putting them into legislation. I know you've been working with one of your local fire chiefs on, uh, on an issue. Uh, he's actually been here in Lansing. Where does that stand right now? Well, it's another example, a good example of the principle that I don't have to be an expert on everything as long as I have access to expert advice and counsel. So uh, Midland Fire Chief Chris Coughlin came down and testified in front of the Regulatory Reform Committee uh, just a few weeks ago in favor of legislation, uh, which may seem pedestrian, but uh, the chief feels very strongly about it in terms of fire safety, not only protecting uh, citizens, residents who live in homes or work in buildings, but protecting the firefighters who have to go into these buildings uh, to, to try to, to save property and, and life. And uh, something as simple as making sure that the state fire marshal's appointee to the Buildings Code Commission is somebody who actually knows something about building codes. Uh, right now, it's discretionary. You know, there's all kinds of levels of expertise in the fire service, some of which has nothing to do with building codes or having that knowledge. And yet there is a certification that somebody can earn in the fire service for knowing about building codes. And so we've got a piece of legislation that uh, after having testified to the committee and gotten feedback from Republicans and Democrats, uh, both of whom are supportive of, of the general concept, is I think what the legislation that will move forward is going to require that the state fire marshal appointee to the Buildings Code Commission uh, that works on the building codes that, that determine construction standards and that kind of thing is going to be somebody who knows what they're talking about. Uh, and that seems pretty simple and com common sense uh, type legislation. Uh, but uh, I would not have known to propose it, except that Chief Coughlin brought it to my attention, and that's my job, uh, among other things, is to, uh, to serve uh, my constituency, and uh, Chief Coughlin certainly is a constituent whose uh, ability and passion for fire safety issues I respect. And so I expect that that uh, legislation changed a little bit from the way we initially introduced it. Uh, we'll pass the committee. I think it'll pass the House. I think it's got a good chance of becoming law. Uh, so that's, that's one where I, I would say thank you to Chief Kaplan for having brought that to my attention and happy to, to do what he wanted me to do, was to, which was to get it before the legislature and hopefully change public policy. And Representative, isn't that almost a textbook case? You know, maybe you'd learn in high school of how the system is supposed to work. Someone at the local level, maybe an expert in the field, yeah. goes to their local lawmaker and helps introduce and ultimately hopefully pass legislation that potentially you know could even save lives. Well and it's a practical bread and butter type piece of legislation but one that probably doesn't get front page coverage compared to some that are controversial but uh, you know pr probably 10 percent of the bills we deal with in Lansing are controversial the other 90 percent are housekeeping type legislation that nonetheless may have significant impact in this case uh, you know Chief Coughlin passionately argues uh, would result in uh, safer buildings, safer homes and, and uh, businesses, and safer places where, in the worst case, if they're on fire, firefighters are less at risk when they have to go try and control those fires. You are also working on legislation dealing with individuals serving in the Michigan National Guard, and you were talking about uh, non-controversial, maybe bipartisan support. Here's a case, too, where you've been developing some bipartisan backing for what you have in mind. Yeah, uh, in fact, uh, I'm going to introduce a bill, and this was, uh, we first formulated this in, in uh, the wake of the shooting that took place down in Chattanooga, uh, where somebody walked into uh, 
uh, a National Guard recruiting facility and, and shot and killed a number of military personnel uh, who were not armed. And it was the uh, policy apparently under the Pentagon of, uh, you know, just like what happened at Fort Hood, uh, members of the military who are trained in the use of weapons and they're not armed on their own bases and their own offices and therefore were vulnerable to uh, what, what in both cases Fort Hood and Chattanooga terrorist attacks. Uh, so this legislation would require that in the uh, 30 some public facilities for the Michigan Army and Air National Guard that are either training facilities or I think there are half a dozen storefront recruiting offices that in those places that somebody can just walk in, any member of the public can just walk in, there are no armed guards, that at least one military personnel on duty at all times in these places when they're open to the public is in fact armed and trained in the use of the weapon uh, and able to use it to defend themselves and their fellow servicemen and women. So I have, as co-sponsors of this legislation, every member of the Military and Veterans Affairs Committee, Republican and Democrat. Uh, and have Democrats and Republicans be on the committee, but significantly every single member of both parties of the Military and Veterans Affairs Committee uh, that supports this legislation, including the chairman of the committee, who is the only member of the legislature who is currently serving in the uh, Michigan Army National Guard. And so, of course, the, the point is to allow our military personnel to be in a position to defend themselves and their fellow servicemen and women when they're in public in a potentially vulnerable situation. Uh, so I, I think we'll have a good chance of getting that through the Military and Veterans Affairs Committee. If it's a, if it's a, it might get sent to judiciary, but I think the fact that every single member of Military and Veterans Affairs is a co-sponsor is a pretty strong signal that people feel strongly about this issue. Uh, and there's, you know, I'm a co-sponsor of other um, uh, gun-related legislation too, uh, what's called constitutional carry. Uh, there are about six states that have adopted that policy. Basically, it says that if you're not a felon and you haven't been diagnosed with a mental illness or impairment and you're otherwise legally qualified to carry a gun, that basically you can carry openly or concealed uh, as you choose to do without a permit, without a requirement of training. Uh, most people don't, under, don't understand or aren't aware of the fact that uh, anybody in Michigan who's otherwise qualified to carry a weapon can carry one openly on their hip if they want. No requirement of training, no requirement to pay the state a permit for the privilege of your Second Amendment uh, gun rights to defend yourself and your family and, and other people in the community who may be around you. But in, you know, as I look at this issue, you know, when even our military personnel are vulnerable to a terrorist attack, this is not the 21st century we expected. It's not the one we want or wanted. But the reality of today's world is even in the United States of America, whether it be Chattanooga or San Bernardino or Fort Hood, Texas, um, the threat of terrorist activity on American soil is greater than it has been in the past. It's not something we grew up with as children, uh, and yet it is before us today. And I think in that context of today's environment that the more law-abiding citizens who are armed and capable of def defending themselves, their family, their property, other people around them in a movie theater, a workplace, wherever it may be, the better. Uh, it doesn't matter what our laws say in terms of terrorists having a gun or somebody with criminal motivations having a gun. It doesn't matter what the laws say because they're not going to obey the law. They're not going to be restrained by the law. And so by definition, in the absence of law-abiding citizens' ability to freely carry as they see fit, then you're by default guaranteeing that the only people who are going to be carrying openly or concealed without restriction will be those who disobey the law. And so I, I just believe that as many people as possible who are law-abiding with good intentions, who are capable of defending themselves and uh, can be, be legally armed to do so, the better. And uh, in two, I think, I think it's two of the six states uh, that have this policy already, the number of people who got the training voluntarily, after it was no, no longer mandatory, actually went up. Uh, and people would still have a reason to get a permit, uh, perhaps if they wanted to make sure they had reciprocal ability to carry concealed in another state uh, if they were traveling. Uh, but uh, I, I just see this as an extension of, you know, the Second Amendment says the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That's pretty clear, straightforward, seems to be unambiguous language. And yet currently, 
somebody can legally carry openly and we require them to get eight hours of training and pay a permit fee to the government to wear a coat. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense to require training and pay the government just to be able to put your coat on when if you leave your coat off you can carry a gun openly without any training, without paying the government. Uh, so I'm a co-sponsor of those bills as well. And along with it, the, the uh, requirement that at least one member of our National Guard be armed anytime they're on duty in a facility open to the public. All part of a package, the intent is to protect law-abiding citizens. Uh, and so proud to be a co-sponsor of that legislation as well. Representative, we've been talking about listening to constituents. That listening has been going on both here in Lansing and for that matter, you'll be doing it again back home in the district. Yeah, uh, we have meeting. We're actually in session in Lansing, uh, John, as you know, on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, Mondays, Fridays, and Saturdays, have meetings uh, back home uh, in my district in Midland and, and Bay Counties, uh, resp responsible for representing folks in both. But I recently met, for example, with uh, uh, the new president of the Midland Chamber of Commerce and Midland Tomorrow, which is an economic development organization in Midland County uh, and met uh, just a couple of days ago with Farm Bureau members from both uh, Bay County and Midland County. So, uh, you know, we have a diverse district economically. We're very manufacturing centric uh, with Dow Corning and Dow Chemical uh, and uh, Midland Cogeneration Venture, lots of other business development and uh, manufacturing uh, present in the district, but also a pretty sizable farming community as well. And uh, so, you, you, as I said, it's a good thing you don't have to be an expert on everything, but if you find people in the district who are experts, I rely on them and, uh, and let them lead. Uh, you know, there are some issues that I feel strongly about and, and on which I do have expertise, but uh, I'm also responsible for introducing uh, legislation that serves the people of my district based on their expertise. I'm not an expert on everything. Um, and so, uh, Look forward to continuing. I'm now what uh, we're now 14 months into the job. This is going to be my second year uh, as a member of the Michigan House of Representatives. I think I know more than I did a year ago, and I uh, think I can be more effective at it. Um, you know, was was proud to be named Freshman Legislator of the Year sure. out of 55 some selected by the the Capitol Press Corps. Uh, I don't intend to sit around resting on those laurels so to speak, uh, but uh, I sh the people should expect me to be all the more effective the fact that I've been here now for 14 months. Certainly it's my intention to, to do everything I can to, to do the job effectively. Okay. Representative, thank you very John, much. John, thank you. Good talking Appreciate to you again. It. Good to see you again. And I'm John Perry. Thank you for joining us.